a couple objectives when we're looking at developing a new freeze drying cycle or optimizing an existing one is that we want to be able to do this uh, using a minimum amount of valuable active pharmaceutical ingredient or, or, or protein product when we're developing this cycle. Um, what we need to do throughout this cycle is we need to measure and calculate our critical process parameters such as our heat and mass flow, our KV, vial heat transfer coefficient, and our product cake resistance, RP. Um, by developing, by determining these uh, critical process parameters, we can develop an optimized product thermal history and use this to develop a robust transferable protocol. Uh, the piece of equipment that we'll be specifically talking about uh, to do this work is, is the MicroFD uh, with LyoSim and LyoPat. The MicroFD is a small freeze dryer that can utilize between 7 to 61 vials, depending on the size of the vials, uh, to completely um, develop a freeze drying run. The LyoSim is a system in the MicroFD that eliminates the edge effect and making all the vials behave like center vials. Essentially, the LyoSim is the piece of equipment in the MicroFD that makes running a small batch of vials possible or feasible. Uh, this can't be done, uh, for example, on a larger tray unit by just using a small array of vials because that will not be representative of what a full tray will behave like. Um, so when we're using the micro FD with the Lyosim, it eliminates the edge effect so all the vials behave like center vials and we can use this as a representative cycle for a larger freeze dryer. Uh, the th quick theory behind this, li uh, behind this Lyosim is that um, uh, based on the edge effect, um, as many are familiar with, is that vials on the outside of an array are only uh, in contact with three or four other vials, three or four other points of contact. And even not just the very outside rows, but the second uh, row, and to some extent, sometimes even the third row, um, also experiences uh, some form of edge effect um, due to uh, the effect of the radiant and convective energy on the outside of a vial. Um, so the solution is to bring in uh, temperature controlled lyosome blocks that simulate the presence of a wider array of vials for this small array of vials. Um, thereby uh, creating uniform heat flow uh, for the edge vials of the array as if they were in center vials. Uh, so the complete design solution for this uh, is a temperature controlled lyosome ring um, that uh, on the outside of the array and then uh, aluminum blocks um, resting on the ring that bring that temperature controlled ring into thermal contact with the array of vials. Uh, when we use this lyosome ring and we set this ring to track the product temperature during the primary drying phase, uh, so again, these uh, blocks on the outside are all at the same temperature as the product in the vials here, uh, simulating again a wider array of vials present in the freeze dryer, which leads uh, to a uniform uh, batch of drying. Uh, here we can see uh, some example test results where we have a percent dried measured gravimetrically uh, between 23 and 26 percent. Uh, which is well within the range of uniformity you would see in a full batch of vials in a tray freeze dryer. Uh, so that was just a quick, quick overview of the MicroFD and the LyoSim, the freeze dryer, uh, the small scale freeze dryer, and the LyoSim ring, which makes using a small scale freeze dryer possible. Um, just as important, if not more so, when we're looking at developing and optimizing a cycle, is the LyoPat which is a suite of advanced tools for freeze drying, which include freeze booster for controlled nucleation, AccuFlux for post-nucleation heat flux control, and auto dry for closed loop primary drying process optimization. So when, so when we're looking at developing a, a new or optimizing an existing uh, freeze drying cycle, using the LyoPat features uh, available in the MicroFD, there's a general process that we like to, uh, we like to recommend and look for. Uh, this starts with analyzing your existing uh, or new cycle by running a regular, uh, plain, recipe-based freeze-drying cycle, either 
based on uh, the existing conditions you run at currently or based on um, typically a more conservative looking cycle uh, that you can safely process your your product at. Uh, during the cycle is when we can uh, calculate using the LiOPAT heat flux sensor our critical process parameters throughout the run and we'll use our post processing uh, to, to get normalized results um, accounting for all the heat flow in the system. Um, we then can look to optimizing this run um, using the various optimization features at our disposal. These are again the freeze booster for controlled nucleation, AccuFlux for di direct heat flux measurement and control for post nucleation, and auto dry for primary drying cycle optimization. Um, so we notice here that two out of three of these features are built uh, based on optimizing the freezing side of the uh, freeze drying recipe. Um, so only auto dry actually works in primary drying. The freeze booster for controlled nucleation and AccuFlux are features that are used in the freezing phase. Because um, really the foundation of an optimized protocol occurs in the free freezing phase. That's when you're uh, developing the frozen crystal structure within your product that will then be dried off. And that will really determine um, a lot of the critical quality attributes of your final dried cake. So using, so again, using these, these three optimization features, uh, we're going to optimize our cycle to develop a, a better cake, a more uniform cake across the batch, and um, to reduce uh, the cycle time as much as possible. And once we have this optimized protocol, we can then look to transferring it using the critical process parameters that we've calculated um, and by comparing the KVs between various units that we're looking to transfer to. Um, so a brief overview of a uh, case study that was done um, using the micro FD of reducing a cycle time uh, shows that um, broadly we were able to reduce the cycle time uh, by over 40% from using just on the left here a uh, completely recipe based cycle where we're just uh, ramping during freezing and then ramping up and drying at a uh, steady temperature uh, in primary drying. And then every successive bar here uh, represents the addition of one additional um, optimization feature. So first we have controlled nucleation, then we have controlled nucleation and the AccuFlux heat flow control post nucleation. And then finally we have the controlled nucleation, the post nucleation, uh, AccuFlux control and auto dry and primary drying. Uh, so we noticed that the first two steps of the optimization here did not really um, lead to uh, drastic or even significant reductions in primary drying time, uh, but they did yield um, noticeable results in the in the structure of the product we were drying, and we'll take a look at that um, coming up. So again, to start this process, um, we started with a plain recipe-based freezing program. Um, where we just ramped to a steady temperature and freezing and primary drying. And during the cycle, um, LiOPAT automatically calculated all of our critical process parameters throughout this run, including our KV, our mass flow, and our cake resistance. The specific recipe used here was ramping at 1C per minute to minus 40, and then drying at, uh, at minus 25C and 60 millitor. The product used for this example was 5% sucrose, uh, 2 milliliters in 6R vial, and there were 19 vials used in this array. Um, and again, um, so these are some of the critical process parameters that have been calculated for us during this first analyzed run um, by the LiOPAT software using that heat flux sensor. We calculate our vial thermal conductivity, cake resistance, our mass flow, um, and then we have our uh, product temperature and shelf temperature from standard thermocouples. And these are the, the data results we'll see, um, again, from our, our basic ramp freezing recipe. Um, this red line we see here is the heat flux that we're measuring from the vials. And the green line represents our product, average product temperature. Um, so we notice that this green line um, has a bunch of little jagged marks in it. And each of those jagged marks represents a, a single vial that's being monitored with a thermocouple nucleating spontaneously. 
Um, they also correspond to dips in the heat flux as well as that vial nucleates and the temperature rises up close to zero degrees Celsius. The temperature difference between the product and the shelf increases and we see a, a sharp uh, increase, a sharp negative spike in the heat flux. Um, and what we notice here is that we have vials nucleating um, at a range of different times and temperatures, um, followed by a sharp deep V in the heat flux. So what this means is that um, due to the random spontaneous nucleation, uh, we have non-uniformity um, across the batch of vials since they're nucleating at different temperatures and different times, and then after nucleation, they're gonna be freezing at different rates. We have non-uniformity across the batch of vials, as well as non-uniformity within the crystal structure of each vial as well. Because once we uh, initially nucleate, and we see an approximately maybe 10 or 15 degree difference between the product temperature and the shelf temperature, and we're freezing at approximately a rate of, for example, maybe 800 watts per meter squared early on in the freezing. Um, that heat flux here of minus 800 watts per meter squared is directly proportional to the rate of freezing and crystal formation. So the faster we're freezing, the slower, or the faster the free, we are freezing, uh, the smaller crystal structure we're having. So initially we're freezing, you know, maybe relatively slow at minus 600 to minus 800 watts per meter squared. But as that shelf continues ramping down and our product while freezing still stays up, uh, near the freezing point close to zero degrees Celsius, that temperature difference begins to grow. So that heat flux begins to uh, increase in magnitude as well. We're towards the end of the freezing. We're now freezing at close to minus 1200 or minus 400 watts per meter squared. So we're freezing at almost twice the rate, which means we're, at, we're uh, growing ice crystals uh, much quicker and much smaller. Um, this leads to non-uniformity within the structure of each vial. Uh, some of the results we get after this is that for this run, um, again, drying at minus 25 degrees Celsius, um, we have a primary drying time of 26.7 uh, hours. Uh, that doesn't really say much since we're not comparing it to anything right here, but we'll take a look at how this compares as we optimize the cycle in the following slides. So as we had uh, mentioned before, the, one of the most important uh, parts of optimizing a freeze drying cycle begins in the freezing phase. Um, so we want to understand uh, the impact of varying our freezing methods by either varying freezing rates, um, the addition of a annealing step or two, um, or what we're going to address more specifically uh, using controlled nucleation. So why do we want to control nucleation? There's a couple really important reasons why. Uh, most importantly is that it creates a more hom homogeneous batch by forcing crystallization to occur at all of the vials at the same time at the same degree of supercooling. This produces both consistency across that batch as well as consistency between batches, between subsequent batches that are all being nucleated at the same time. Additionally, in some cases, it is shown to reduce cycle time but that's not, the primary, um, that's not the primary purpose or benefit of controlled nucleation. That is something that happens in some cycles, but primarily the benefit of controlled nucleation is that it produces the same degree of supercooling and uh, increases uh, homogeneity and batch consistency. Um, in addition, um, So here, when we've used controlled nucleation, we can take a look at the data results we've gotten from the freezing phase of using controlled nucleation. Here we can say, by looking at the green average product temperature, that we have one single large spike, uh, which means all the thermocouples, all the vials with thermocouples are nucleating at the same exact time and at the same exact cooling temperature, uh, super cooling temperature. Um, and again, we see one sharp spike in the heat flux, but then it is still followed by that deep V. So although we've used freeze booster, we've used controlled nucleation to get uniformity across the batch here, we still have non-uniformity within each vial due to that varying rate of freezing uh, 
during that freezing process as that shelf is ramping down. So again, early on after nucleation, we're freezing at a relatively slow rate of minus 600 watts per meter squared here. Um, then as our shelf temperature continues to drop while our product temperature remains largely the same, that temperature difference grows and towards the end of freezing, we're freezing at twice the rate of minus 1200 watts per meter squared here. So there's still that non-uniformity within the structure of each file. Um, but we did create more homogeneity and batch consistency uh, across the batch. Um, the results we get from this, um, again, we can see we've for this run, we had a drying time of 26.1 hours. So that's, although that's not statistically significant or um, drastic, what we do see is we see an improvement in our product cake resistance and the temperature of our product as it's drying. Uh, so one of the reasons we don't see a large reduction in primary drying time is that in this first run, we had uh, all of our vials nucleating between minus three and minus five degrees Celsius uh, because these were not run in a clean room environment. So there was, you know, dust or particulate that led to nucleation uh, before large degrees of supercooling. In a lab or production clean room environment, we can see typically, uh, you know, minus 10, minus 15, or even up to minus 20 degrees of supercooling before autonucleation. Um, and when they nucleate at such a low temperature, it leads to rapid, very small crystal formation um, and a higher cake resistance. So we didn't see a huge reduction in primary drying time between here because we were already nucleating at a relatively, uh, relatively high temperature of minus three to minus five degrees C. So when we did controlled nucleation at minus five degrees C, um, we didn't improve that nucleation time too much. Um, or that nucleation temperature too much or our primary drying time, but we did improve our cake structure and we improved our product temperature. So although we continued to dry this run at minus 25 degrees Celsius, we potentially could have increased this temperature um, by maybe five or two to three or maybe five degrees Celsius more um, while keeping our product temperature still um, safely below its critical temperature. Now that we've used controlled nucleation as the first step of optimizing our freezing side of this freeze drying recipe, we want to uh, finalize and completely optimize uh, this freeze drying recipe by using AccuFlux for post nucleation heat flow control. What this does, this feature does, is it controls the shelf temperature based on a user set heat flow setting. For example, minus 400 watts per meter squared, which says after nucleation, we want to maintain this steady heat flow for the rest of the duration of freezing, which leads to a constant rate of crystallization and a uniform crystal structure throughout the vial. One thing important to note is that for typical degrees of supercooling uh, between minus five to minus 10 degrees Celsius, uh, during that nucleation event, only about eight to 12% of the water actually freezes and forms an ice crystal. The rest, slowly crystallizes after that nucleation event. And that's where we see the non-uniformity in the vial if we just straight ramp the shelf temperature down. Um, so we want to use the AccuFlux to steadily freeze that remaining 90% of the water. And here's what um, this data looks like uh, for a run that's using both controlled nucleation and AccuFlux. So we see again, the single nucleation event uh, where we've achieved batch uniformity through controlled nucleation. And we see then that we've cut, we've eliminated this deep V of freezing by telling the system to control the shelf temperature um, to maintain a certain heat flux setting. Uh, for this run, the setting was minus 400 watts per meter squared. So it initially had to ramp the shelf down a little bit to get the heat flux there. And then it maintains it uh, pretty steadily there. Uh, we see it's not a perfectly smooth heat flux line here, but it's a vast improvement on that deep V of freezing we saw before. Um, so we've both, again, uh, achieved uniformity across the batch, as well as uniformity within the structure of that vial. And here are the results we see after this. Um, again, this was then after this freezing protocol, it was dried using that same conditions of minus 25 C and 60 millitor. And we saw a slight reduction in primary drying time of about 8%. Um, 
which is which is something, but it's not crazy. Um, but what we did see, which is very significant, is a over two and a half degree reduction in our product temperature as it's drying. And we've effectively halved our product cake resistance by creating such a uniform crystal structure throughout each of those vials. Um, we've left a uniform dried cake structure once all that ice is sublimated away. So again, why we for this run, maintained the same primary drying conditions of minus 25 degrees Celsius. Um, for comparison's sake, we easily could have increased this shelf temperature by up to 10 degrees more um, while still keeping our product safely below its critical temperature. Now that we've completely optimized freezing through both controlled nucleation and the use of AccuFlux for post-nucleation heat flow control, now we can finally take a look at optimizing our primary drying. Uh, the feature we use to optimize our primary drying is called auto dry, which is based on uh, closed loop feedback um, based on the thermocouples in your product. So the theory that auto, that auto dry uses um, is that early in primary drying, where you have no uh, cake resistance uh, built up, is when you can more safely maximize the heat input or shelf temperature uh, to your product. Later on in the cycle, once you start building up a, a cake resistance that's going to start raising your product temperature um, and raising the effective pressure at the sublimation interface, that's when you want to then reduce your shelf temperature to keep your product safe. But early on, when there is no dried cake resistance and your uh, interface pressure is the pressure that you're controlling it. That's when you can really drive a lot of heat into your product and all of that heat's going to go straight towards sublimation without warming your product temperature beyond its critical temperature. So that's the that's the theory that auto dry works on is that it's going to maximize the shelf temperature early on in the cycle and then gradually reduce it to maintain your product below its critical temperature. Um, at the same time the auto drive uh, feature conducts a pressure drop test, which is used to determine any thermocouples that are out of ice. So during the pressure drop test, which happens at a user set interval uh, between 30 to 180 minutes, um, every interval, the system will reduce the chamber pressure by setting the set point to zero and reduce the chamber pressure for a minute and a half. And during that time, as the pressure in the chamber is reduced, it shifts the solid vapor equilibrium to a colder temperature. So all the ice uh, remaining in the product is going to reduce in temperature. And any thermocouples that are still in ice, um, still submerged in the ice, are going to see a temperature drop as well. So any thermocouples that do not see a significant temperature drop are then considered out of ice, and we won't use those for control. We'll only use the thermocouples that are still in ice. So if a thermocouple pops out of ice early and starts rising in temperature, we know we don't have to worry about it because it's not actually in your frozen product. So the, the results of this auto dry run uh, are what we can see here. Uh, for this run, we used the same freezing protocol as the run before it, where we used both controlled nucleation and AccuFlux for post-nucleation heat flow control. And then instead of drying at a steady temperature of minus 25 degrees C, we used auto dry. So for auto dry, we set our baseline temperature, our initial temperature at that same minus 25 degrees Celsius here. And we set a time period of 90 minutes um, for it to hold at this temperature and for the thermocouples and shelf and everything to reach equilibrium. After this hold time had, had elapsed, we conducted our first pressure drop test seen by these small spikes. Um, and then we began our shelf adjustments. And we can see that our uh, shelf temperature increased up near to my, about minus three degrees Celsius. Um, and every hour or 90 minutes or so, it's conducting this pressure drop test to determine if any thermocouples are out of ice. And as our product temperature begins to rise and approach our critical temperature, it then lowers the shelf temperature back down to maintain our product below that critical temperature before finally near the end of um, the cycle, before shortly before all the thermocouples begin to pop out of ice, uh, it reaches a final set point temperature. Um, the settings we used for this run 
uh, we used sucrose, so we set a critical temperature of minus 32 degrees C, and we set a 2 degree safety offset, which means that AutoDry is going to try to maintain our product at minus 34 degrees C. So we see there are some times, uh, uh, right around here for example, where it looks like the product may have uh, approached or even surpassed that minus 34 degrees C a little bit. That's why we have this 2 degree safety offset. And as soon as it passes that, that target temperature, AutoDry uh, rapidly ramps that shelf temperature down um, to reduce the product temperature and keep it safe below our critical temperature. The results we see from this are that um, our primary drying time has been reduced to 15.2 hours. So a pretty significant reduction in primary drying time. Uh, during primary drying, auto dry brought the shelf temperature to a max temperature of about minus three degrees, and then a uh, shelf temperature of about minus 14 degrees C uh, as, as the final temperature it landed on. So it reached a max temperature of minus three, and then would reduce down to minus 14 and dried there. And we can see that this reduced the primary drying time in half and still kept the product safely below its critical temperature minus that two degree offset. So again, that was minus 32 degrees, the two degree safety offset. So we controlled at minus 34 degrees C. Uh, the final results of this run is that we've taken our initial recipe based freeze drying protocol at 26.7 hours, and we've reduced that 26.7 hours of primary drying time, and we've, we've reduced that to 15.2 hours. Uh, which is a total reduction of about 43%. These are what the final optimized results look like. Um, uh, here we can see the Pirani convergence for both of these, as well as the reduced optimized product cake resistance as well. So as a quick summary, um, the, the steps we took to optimize this protocol were to run an existing recipe-based cycle, then to begin to optimize the freezing phase by choosing to uh, vary freezing rates, uh, add an annealing step, or in our case, add controlled nucleation. And then we fully optimized freezing by using both controlled nucleation and post-nucleation AccuFlux heat flow control. The final step for creating a completely optimized cycle was to enable auto dry in primary drying, which then optimized uh, the primary drying phase. We have both a fully optimized freezing and a fully optimized primary drying phase in this cycle. Okay, so now that we've looked at how to develop an optimized cycle, we want to look at how we can take a cycle and transfer it to a next next size unit. So if we're going from lab to pilot or pilot to production, um, the theory is essentially the same. Um, that is that the goal when we're transferring is to maintain an equivalent product temperature thermal history between the lab and commercial processes. Um, one standard um, safe way of transferring a cycle is to maintain uh, the same settings we used on our smaller scale unit um, and then extend primary drying time. So the trend that we see is that the larger we, the unit we move to, the inherent KV um, of that cycle goes down. So if a cycle runs safely on a smaller unit and we take those same settings and run them a, on a larger unit, we can be very uh, confident that they will run safely. And we can see that here. Here we have a cycle um, that was dried in a micro FD at 100 millitor at zero degrees C uh, in the red line here and the corresponding product temperature in the purple line here. And that same recipe, uh, this product was 5% mannitol, was then run in a Revo or a uh, lab scale unit at zero degrees C. And we can see the heat flux uh, in the center of the batch for this cycle in the orange line and the corresponding product temperature in the light blue line. So here we can see that it's drying at a slower rate. We have a lower heat flux, which means a lower sublimation rate. 
Um, and overall, it takes about 30% longer to run. Um, so again, a safe way to transfer it is just use the same cycle conditions and extend that primary drying time. Another way to uh, transfer a cycle is to take a closer look at the KVs um, that the vials are running at in each system. So here we take our formula for KV, and this can be determined through AccuFlux, where we use the heat flux sensor uh, to directly measure the KV, or gravimetrically by weighing the vials before and after um, uh, primary drying, um, during a portion of the primary drying cycle. So here we take this equation for KV, and we rearrange it a little bit. Um, so we have heat flux on one side all, of its, uh, on, all on its own. So we have KV times the T shelf minus T product equals the heat flux. And we'll do that for both systems, and then we'll set those heat fluxes equal to each other. And we'll rearrange it again to see what the new T shelf we should use is. So if we do that, um, here's the equation we get when we've rearranged it. And it essentially comes down to the ratio between the KV of the source unit and the KV of the target unit that we're transferring to. Um, for this example, and in this form of the equation, the KV we used uses the shelf surface temperature to measure the KV. So we measured the KV using the shelf surface temperature in our source unit and in our target unit. Uh, the same exact thing can be done if we use our KV using the shelf inlet temperature. Um, we just want to make sure that whatever reference we're using, whether it's the surface or the inlet temperature, is consistent between uh, each unit. So again, for this unit, we use the shelf surface temperature. Because we use the shelf surface temperature, we also need to include an additional term, uh, this delta T, which is the difference between the inlet and the surface temperature of the target unit. Um, we see uh, comparing our microFD and our Revo, in the microFD we had a KV of 22.16 watts per meter squared C, and in the Revo in the center of the shelf we had a KV of 18.01 watts per meter squared C. Um, so here's like I'd, where I'd like to mention that when we're looking to transfer a cycle to a larger system using this method, we want to focus on whether we're transferring with the center vials in mind or transferring with the edge vials in mind. If we're transferring with the edge vials in mind, we would use the KV of the edge, which would be a higher KV. Um, and when we do that, we'll transfer our cycle so that our edge vials will dry the same as our vials in the micro FD did, which may lead to our center vials taking longer to dry and it being a little conservative for the uh, center vials, but also safe for the edge vials. At the same time, um, as we did in this example, we can transfer it with the center vials in mind, so we'll use the KV from the center of our batch. Um, so when we do this, we're going to transfer so that the center vials dry the same in the Revo as they did in the microFD. Uh, keeping in mind that when we're transferring with the center in mind, which is more of an a, aggressive cycle, we're going to dry, do this so that the center vials dry the same as they did in the microFD. But under these conditions, the edge vials may dry uh, a little too warmly. So it may be risking some of your edge vials if you're transferring with the center in mind. Um, and this comes down to a product and uh, a product decision and a company-based company financial decision. Um, if we're looking at a very large uh, freeze dryer with a large tray, then those edge vials may only be 5% of your total batch, and maybe it's more efficient to then transfer with the center vials in mind, so we have a faster batch drying, um, and 95% of those center vials are drying faster and are usable. If we're transferring to a smaller unit where the edge vials are a considerable portion of the batch, maybe 20 or 30 percent, then we may want to uh, transfer this cycle with the edge vials in mind because we don't want to risk ruining 20 or 30 percent of the batch. Um, so we'll transfer with the edge vials in mind and the centered vials will still dry a little bit more conservatively and a little bit slower, um, but we'll have a full safe batch. Um, so those are the two considerations uh, or one consideration with two main options you want to keep in mind when you're looking to transfer a cycle is if you want to transfer with the center ed vials in mind or with the edge vials in mind. Um, so back to this example here, we were transferring with the center in mind. Um, so we used the equation from the previous slide comparing the KVs between the microFD and the Revo. 
and we see that the Revo has a slightly lower KV than the Micro FD. So what this tells us is that we want, and again, this KV was based on a shelf surface temperature. Um, so the, the ratio of the KVs here is telling us we want our surface temperature to be about 2.7 degrees higher than it was before, or we want it to be about 2.7 degrees um, Celsius, uh, accounting for that um, difference between the inlet and the surface temperature of 1.5 to C. This gives us a control inlet temperature of about 4.2 uh, degrees C, uh, for which we used 4 degrees C. And the results we get looking at this is that we can see that in this orange dotted line, the center Revo heat flux uh, matches the uh, heat flux of the micro FD almost exactly. Uh, so by, by comparing those KVs and adjusting the shelf temperature based on the difference in the KVs, we can achieve a virtually identical uh, thermal profile going into those vials. We can see that the product temperature uh, in the Revo here when we're drying at 4 degrees C is a little bit higher than in the micro FD, but we can see for earlier on in the cycle, but we can see that these uh, end up matching up almost almost identically towards the end of the cycle, uh, right before the thermocouples are popping out of ice. Um, overall, we might say that this was uh, four to, plus 4C was a little bit too aggressive uh, and maybe using three, to three degrees Celsius instead would have been ideal. Uh, but in any case, we were able to look at the two KVs between the source and the target unit, compare them and adjust our shelf temperature accordingly to achieve the same uh, thermal history result. And we can see the same thing when we look at the Pirani and capacitance uh, convergence, which lead to a cycle time that is uh, virtually identical, only three minutes apart. Uh, so overall, um, after we've optimized our cycle and we go to transfer it, we've, uh, we've done it in such a way that the sublimation rates and the heat transfer were very similar between the two machines, resulting in a similar or almost identical processing time. And throughout this process, we were able to do this using only 19 vials rather than hundreds for every step of the way. So every consecutive run between optimizing and then transferring, uh, we've used 19 vials in our micro FD. Now, depending on the vial size, we can be using between uh, 7 and 61 for very small vials, um, but still much less than the hundreds that are required to do this work on a, a tray style lab development unit. Um, and we've uh, still been able to uh, transfer it in such a way that we have the same results in a production unit um, through and throughout this process have been able to save significant time and money and uh, made it an enjoyable development process. Um, so thank you. That is the, the end of uh, the regular webinar here. Um, and now I think we'll open it up to questions.